Hey, this is Brad with Rev, and I'm joined by John Taylor from Rev's mechanical engineering team. Hey, I'm excited to be talking about the 2025-2026 Rev Duo FTC starter bot. And John Taylor was the lead designer and builder of this year's bot. And so there's no one better to decode and walk us through the design choices, mechanisms, and features that make this build unique. All right, JT, well, this, this robot looks amazing. Um, let's start with the drivetrain. What do we have going on here? Sure, we're using the channel drivetrain from the Duo V 3.1 kit. And the only change that we made to it is we replaced the center wheels with, so that we could use the traction wheels on the, on the flywheel up here. Gotcha. And then, of course, there's an adjustment of the sliding part up here. Okay. Um, and so then going from the, so we have a, basically a really foundational good drivetrain going on that teams are going to be used to, and you kind of built upon that. Um, so now that we have these pieces, the game piece this year, which is the artifacts in these two colors, uh, the green and the purple, what are the artifacts? W walk us through basically the process of getting it into the robot. What's going on here? Sure. So this robot's designed to be human player loaded. So we go up to the human player loading zone, and then the, the human player can put up to three artifacts inside the robot and into the hopper directly. And okay. so they'll, they'll drop them right in. And we have this surgical tubing right here to try to bounce them over to the side, over into the chute. The other reason that we have the surgical tubing is to passively agitate the, the artifacts so that way they will make their way over towards the shooter direction. Gotcha. And I assume even this, this one up here, the surgical tubing up here is also, I guess when you have three, it kind of helps keep them in there, also just keeping everything going down in that path. Right. Um, and so now, an interesting thing is we have the servo here. What is the servo doing? Tell me about that. Sure. This, this servo actually wasn't in our original design. We, mm -hmm. we built this robot, and then we realized that we needed an active agitation somewhere up here gotcha. to keep things from jamming up. And so this will spin this small arm around, and as it spins, it'll constantly agitate. I can show you one right here. So the, uh, the agitator will spin, and it will push the artifacts up out of the way. That way it'll just bounce them and then they'll end up going in there. Perfect. Okay, so that, that active agitator is really necessary to kind of keep things going there. Um, so now that we're kind of like loaded in, we're getting to this point, um, tell me about this little, I guess, feed roller? What, what, what would this be? Sure. So this is a feed roller and it works against the chute. And the feed roller has two flap wheels with the flaps almost all the way cut off. That way they can bite into the artifact. And then... The feed roller, as well as the chute, helps center the artifact into the launcher. And so the centering will happen up here, and then the launcher will take it once it's centered. And to keep the centering on the bottom, we've added two sheets of corrugated plastic that act as rails. So that way, if the artifact is over here or over here, it'll naturally get pushed into the center. And the flat wheels help with that a lot. Gotcha. So it finds that kind of like the old channel where the ball has the lowest point and wants to kind of always center. And that's, I guess, really key to, right. especially a launcher, is to make sure that the ball is consistently going into the same yes. way. Yeah. Every single shot is the same. That's the goal. Right. And so, so this also then lets you control it. And this is a core hex motor, correct? Yes. The core hex motor. And that lets you then set when you are then pushing it into the next stage, which is the launcher, which I assume needs to be spun up beforehand. Right. But also, what's going on? Why are there gears here? What's going on with the, the launcher? Sure. We've added some gears to the shaft of the launcher. That way, there's more moment of inertia, a, a higher moment of inertia. Gotcha. And moment of inertia is basically a function of how much weight you have as far from the axle as you can get it. So if we added a ton of weight right at the axle, it wouldn't do us much good. But mm -hmm. since this gears are pretty large in diameter and the traction wheels are also pretty high in diameter and almost all the weight is on this outside, it adds lo a really high moment of inertia. So that way the flywheel can keep a consistent velocity as we're shooting artifacts. Gotcha. So that acts as a flywheel. Um, and then what's powering it? Sure. It's powered by an HD hex motor with no gearing on it. Okay. We do use an ultraplanetary gearbox mount just to make it easier to mount. But sure. there's, no, there's no cartridges in there. So it's just one to one. Okay, and then the other side is supported, it looks like. Sure. We actually use a roller bearing here, and it's really important that we use a roller bearing for a wheeled shooter because a uh, bushing, a plastic friction bushing, won't survive in this application. It's spinning too quickly. Gotcha. So that, that ball bearing is really important to be there just because of the high speed that we have on the launcher. So tell me a bit about these wheels and why we're using these wheels and pulling them off the channel drivetrain and putting them here. So we use the grip wheels here instead of the traction wheels. We actually started with the traction wheels, but we found out that the thin wheel will get 
will ride into a hole in the artifact and cause an inconsistent shot because it'll be different each time. But the grip wheels here, mm -hmm. they have a wide enough contact patch, especially when you put two of them next to each other, that we can always reliably hit the smooth part of the artifact to make for a consistent shot. So as the, as the artifact's traveling through the launcher, now getting really sped up, we're, we're hitting this section here. Right. What is this section exactly? Sure. So this section is our adjustable launcher deflector, and it allows us to adjust the shot to tune it in as we need it. And you can slide these brackets forward and backward. Mm -hmm. You can also adjust the angle up and down, and you can also adjust this slider in and out. So that way teams have full control over their shot that they can calibrate in between matches or before before competition. Gotcha. So so between kind of the, the deflector adjustment as well as I guess the speed of the, the fly right, right here uh, and those launch wheels, you can kind of get the shot to where you need it to be. Exactly. It's really convenient too. Even with one deflector adjustment, you can change the speed of the launcher wheel and that will change your shot enough to be able to launch artifacts up close or further back. What are some things that um, you would recommend in terms of adjustment and, and kind of fine tuning to get the launcher kind of more dialed in? Sure. A really good start is to ensure that you have a rounded chute back here where the launcher can push through. And you can confirm this by putting an artifact into your launcher and then confirming that it's always contacting and it feels about the same amount of pressure all the way through. And once you've done that, you can start adjusting. So you know, we get started and we'll, we'll launch a few artifacts and we'll see how they go. And we can adjust forward, backward, in, out, and we'll just keep adjusting small adjustments. We have to use a lot of patience mm -hmm. until we end up having a launch that's just about where we want it to where at the maximum velocity we can, we can launch from as far away as we'd like. At, you know, what we determine the minimum velocity to be, we can launch just a really close shot. Right up there. Okay, now going back to, I know it's on the back section here, we actually have this large plate. Can you tell us what this is used for? When teams launch several artifacts into the goal, mm -hmm. they may end up with them arranged the way they'd like, or they may end up with them arranged in a different way, or they may end up with too many artifacts and they need to open the gate. Mm -hmm. This allows the robot to drive into the gate and then push it open. So that way the artifacts are released back onto the, onto the field. Gotcha. And this can pretty much be any material? Right. You can use any flat material uh, that's allowed in the rules. Corrugated plastic, polycarbonate, cardboard. Sure. Okay. Lots of options. Right. And so now going around the robot, we have this very nice little section here, very compact and kind of uh, centralized, I guess. Can you kind of walk me through how we have that set up? Sure. We have all the controls set up in this corner with some extra volume if teams wish to do anything else with it. But it's set up to be where it's accessible, but it's also far enough into the robot that it's, it's reasonably protected during competition play. The battery is sitting directly behind the control hub in a small pocket. Reference the cab model if you'd like to see more information. I'd recommend that teams would add a piece of hook and loop tape to mm -hmm. make sure the battery is perfectly secured just in case something happens. And then we have the power switch right here. And like I said, we left plenty of extra room in this corner that teams can use however they'd like. Okay. And so now we kind of gone through the whole robot. Um, what would be some things that you would say would be a, a, the next point to go to? Maybe sure. to improve the robot's functionality or improve the competitiveness or what have you? Sure. A ground intake is first and foremost. Um, being able to lift artifacts off of the ground is probably going to be pretty influential for gameplay. And there's a really nice area up here on the front edge of the robot that we could use, that teams could use for that. Gotcha. Um, there's also this area back in this corner if teams find a way to use that as well. Yeah, and I mean, I'd love to see some type of a color sensor or something going on yes. to maybe the index a little better so you know what, what is coming in um, right. color-wise to make sure you're getting that pattern, that, that code correctly. Right. It's really important to launch them in the correct sequence. So if, if teams can sort through them while they're in the robot, that would be a really advantageous feature as well. Okay, and, and what would be another improvement that you, might, that you might tackle? A really easy improvement to this robot would be to replace the drivetrain with mechanic wheels. All you have to do is pull the wheels and the chains out and add motors up there. So it's a, it's a pretty simple replacement. And what would that allow you to do, I guess, on the field? Right, that would that would allow you to move forward, backward, sideways. You can move diagonally. You can rotate while moving. You can move in all sorts of directions. So that'd be really advantageous to kind of get on these artifacts, depending on where they are, to right. get get control of them, and then I guess quickly line up and, and launch the balls into the goal. Right. All right.
Um, is there anything else that you might be want to talk about that maybe was difficult or challenging or, or things that you would uh, recommend teams to uh, either experiment with or go to next? Sure. The biggest challenge we had when building this was serializing the game pieces. Even when there's a shoot and a hopper and everything only allows one game piece to sit next to each other, they really like to stuff themselves in ways that are hard to get them unbound. Mm -hmm. So keeping game pieces in a controlled format is probably going to be a difficult but worthwhile challenge. So you mentioned like some of the other materials you could use if you don't have the corrugated plastic. Sure. Um, what would you re maybe recommend? Sure, I'd, I'd recommend polycarbonate. It's a really good replacement for the corrugated plastic for teams that don't have access to it. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's really resilient. And also then it would be clear so you can kind of see through it, right. really see the colored game pieces you have going on from a distance if you don't have a color sensor or another way of uh, monitoring what you have in the robot. It's, it's also really easy to make a consistent arc with it. Hmm. That makes total sense. All right. So in explaining the deflector and even the flywheels, um, consistency with a, a kind of a game that has a launched piece, is there any recommendations you can give to try to keep that consistency or, or aim for that? The biggest, the biggest piece of advice I've had is to ensure that the design a team has has adjustability built in. That could be automated, the robot could control it, or you could adjust it manually. Chances are you're going to need to adjust the angle. Um, as you design in, make sure that your arc is consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have basically low spots and high spots. And once you have that in adjustability, you don't have to worry too much in the design phase about having the perfect shot. You just need to worry about having the same shot every time. Right. Because you can get the perfect shot once you build it. This is the first year we've actually introduced um, in our starter bot Autonomous. Um, what does it do during that, that game phase? Sure. During the autonomous period, we'll spin the flywheel shooter up to a controlled set point, and then we'll launch the three artifacts that start in the robot, and then we'll drive off of, off of the goal. And so then I guess when we start getting into more autonomous, we'll obviously uh, go to our programming video that'll be coming out later, which will walk through the code of that autonomous as well as the, the code for the whole robot and the control of it um, in the future. Thank you so much, John Taylor, for coming and showing us all of the uh, interesting points of the starter bot and walking us through it. I really do appreciate it and um, really excited for the season. Yeah, me too. It's been a blast. And all teams out there, I wish you a, a great time in this, this year's FTC Game Decode. If you are just as excited about the Decode Challenge and the 2025-2026 Rev Duo FTC Starter Bot as we are, you can find more information on our website, revrobotics.com and additionally find the full CAD, build guides, code overviews, and more in our documentation at docs.revrobotics.com. Feel free to leave a comment on this video or reach out to our support team at support at revrobotics.com. Good luck and we can't wait to discover what history you all will make.